Thanks for tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. Welcome to your day off. My name is Corey Gray. And I'm Katie May. Oh, welcome. Welcome, <laughs> welcome to the show, Katie. Hey, um, <laughs> <laughs> didn't know we were doing that for this one too. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Did I throw you off? Yes. A little bit. That's okay. We're even now. We are. Yeah. You, you definitely threw me off last, uh, a few <laughs> times ago. Hey, uh, uh, welcome to the show. And yeah, that voice you hear is Miss Katie May. And Katie is joining me for this conversation. Um, I'm pretty excited about this conversation. Um, It's just, uh, yeah, pick up. I, well, here's the thing. I feel like in our industry, there's this huge wellness push. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's so much more that we need to dive deeper into what wellness is and what we need for hairdressers as far as wellness goes. Like, let's not just, you know, jump into doing yoga and meditation and think we're doing wellness. I think we there's a much deeper thing for hairdressers. And this is what our conversation is going to be today. About about jumping in deeper, jumping in from, deeper. Jumping I want to get deeper. much deeper. Yes, yeah. that's cool, man. I'm I'm down. So uh, so uh, our friend Marlene introduced us to, to to Andy today. Um, and actually, she didn't even introduce us. She was just we were talking about wellness, and we were talking exactly what you were just talking about. Is like you know how can we do more for the industry? How can we how can we you know not it, not just about the yoga and stuff, you know, but like how can we really get into? And then she's like, she just started talking about Andy, not even like as an introduction, not even that we need to be together, but just talked about how much she respected and loved Andy. And then, uh, you know, maybe, I believe her words were you need to know her that well, need those were her know. words. You need to know her. And, th and then with that, we're like, I guess we need to know her. Uh, yeah. Right. And then we had a conversation about a month ago or so. And, you know, about three seconds into the conversation, we were like, we need to know her. So mm -hmm. guess what today is? Today is the need to know. So our guest today is Andy Scarball. And I'll, I'll let her uh, introduce her and what she brings to the industry. But but I'm really interested uh, to getting into her conversation. And more importantly, I'm interested in having that conversation with you about this, too, because I know that this is like this is your love life here or your love language, love mm -hmm. life, love yeah. language, love 100 percent love, love language. Awesome. So should we get in? Yeah. Miss Andy Scarborough, welcome to your day off. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to be here. Th thank you for, 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 for being here. And now uh, where are you calling us from today? I am phoning in from the Oregon coast where it is foggy and in the throes of spooky season up here. You know what? It's kind of Halloween time and like the, 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 the Pacific Northwest kind of like a, a breeds like that spooky, like, you know, time for me you know like when i think about like halloween and spooky it's usually it's usually up there are you from there originally no i grew up in southeast texas but i'm no stranger to spooky woods so the piney woods down northwest of houston however i spent 22 years in los angeles so i got a lifetime fill of sunshine now i'm i'm back to the the rainy joys of that um, I live in a, a weird little geodesic dome home up on the hill. So I'm legit like Baba Yaga's house up here. <laughs> I love it. No need to decorate for Halloween. We are spooky season year round. That's, whoa, 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 whoa. Tell me about your house. <laughs> what kind of dome? <laughs> it's a geodesic dome home. So, you know, folks are into some real inspired business up here in the woods of the Pacific Northwest in the 70s and 80s. What does geodesic um, mean? Geodesic, so it's it's a it's a round house. Yeah. Is it like an igloo like looking thing? If an igloo were spawned out of cedar shingles and spider webs, yeah. Wow. God, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I can't think of like a, a of of three different places to live than like a Eastern Texas and Los Angeles and now the the, the Pacific Northwest. What, what 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 got you to the Pacific Northwest? Oh man, I visited Oregon the first time when I was fourteen, and you know sometimes I don't know if either of you have had this experience, but you visit a place and it's like more of you comes online. 
it was like my whole panel lit up and I just felt like I had access to more inspiration, more aliveness. And then that was, I mean, that was 10 years ago that I came up here the first, well, I was 14 when I came the first time, but 10 years ago, I came up and kind of had that again and started looking in earnest and wound up out here in my little witch house in the woods. That's amazing. I love that. Yeah, I feel that way about Utah, by the way. Like Utah is the state that fires me up. Like, like, oh, yeah. so it's so much more than me. Like it kind of removes my ego a little bit. You know, it's like there, there's something bigger, stronger, all those things, you know, but, but at the same time, like there's a bigger world out there, but also like I'm a part of it. So it's both like this yin and yang kind of like, kind of feeling about like, this is, there's something bigger than me, like I said, ego wise. And then like, but I'm also a part of it, which is very cool too. You know, it's like, it's this very cool connecting, disconnecting, connecting kind of feeling to it. Oh man. I so feel that that is my experience of the woods. A hundred percent. It is humbling to be a part of it. And yet you can't be separate from it. Mm, I love that. I, I'm, now I have, I have this, uh, rational or irrational fear of bears. Do you have any bear run ins? There, I for sure had to stop and break for a little bear running across the the road on my way home the other night. Yes. Well, that's kind of. Uh, they're they're fair. We got more of the like cutesy demure bears on this <laughs> side of things. They just want to like eat apples and hang out. Um, I leave a big stick of blackberries for them, so maybe they stay away from the house. Occasionally, they'll get a little salty, but you know, don't we all? Well, do you have to have, do you have like special like bear trash cans or anything? Yes, sir. We do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. They are clever. And I have found that the raccoons are more nefarious than bears. Sure. So that is more those, those little hands get into some business, but <laughs> well, I love they, them. I can't not love them. They have opposable thumbs, right? Don't raccoons have opposable thumbs? I think they do. Yeah. A little, if I had a pet raccoon, I would train it to be a pet pocket. I think <laughs> that's my retirement plan. That's a good retirement plan. Yeah. You know, take, him down, take, take him down to the big city. Yeah. Have him pickpocket. Oh my God. That's right. That's right. Who can arrest a raccoon? Okay. Mm. Who can? Well, I mean, there can't be crimes. I got stuff, you know? <laughs> I'm pretty sure like in India or someplace, there's like monkeys that do that, right? Like I think there's like monkeys that like pickpocket people and, you know, own their stuff, drive their cars and shit. That's wild, <laughs> man. Know. So a Andy, how did you find the industry? Oh, gosh, you know, this has been the only thing I have done with my adult life. Uh, I grew up in a house in Texas. There were I had six siblings and only one thing to do on weekends, and that was go to the dance at the Silver Wings Ballroom. And so all my sisters and their friends would show up and we would have hot rollers lined up down the, the kitchen counter. And so I became a connoisseur of aerosol hairspray um <laughs> by the time I was like 14 uh and it just really kind of blossomed from there you know I thought I wanted to get into special effects makeup and while a school that I wanted to go to was being accredited I had a friend from high school that said oh you know just kill some time come to beauty school with me you'll learn a little makeup anyway uh and I got into it and just got lit up um I did go and do an internship briefly with the special effects makeup but I missed the people after of it. I didn't realize that that was so much of what I wanted to do creatively. When I was a kid, I thought I wanted to be a seamstress or a paper and then or a, a painter. And then I got into realizing that hair was all of these mediums. And there was a really cool person attached that um, fostered so much more connection. Yeah, that's amazing. When I when, when she was telling the stories about the hot rollers and the um you know, and all the people lined up, all I could smell was like Aussie hairspray. <laughs> we were in Aquanet household, Corey. I don't know what you and your people were doing, but I'm just saying we were, we were, we were split up whether or not we were Texas Longhorns or Anna Maggie's, but we were very clear on the Aquanet. It was definitely the Aquanet then. <laughs> yeah. Take Aquanet. Have you seen Aquanet? I'm sure. I'm sure you can find it in the bottom shelf of a CVS somewhere. I bet maybe Sally's. <laughs> Maybe oh, Sally's. Maybe out. Sally's. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> so, so is that how you travel to LA? No, I packed up my pickup truck like a bad country western song when I was seventeen and left Texas. Um, I knew that I wanted to do hair professionally, and I wanted to go where it was going to be challenging. So I knew that the best in the business were going to be 
New York or LA probably, and I don't do snow. So LA it was. Uh, my father lived in the high desert, so I landed with him briefly and kind of got my bearings and then got right after it. I worked at a community theater. I ran their hair and makeup department for several years while I put myself through beauty school, and I learned so much there uh, and just got right after it. Yeah. So that, that was in LA? You went to hair school in LA or in California? Uh, it was in California, in Southern California, it was technically the Mojave Desert. And then there was a, a woman that I met who had come off the road. She'd had babies. Yeah. Kaylee Coffey was a master colorist for Matrix. And she just took me in and spoon fed me everything I knew about hair color. Um, made me use Logix. I don't know if y'all remember yeah. that color line. Yeah. Um, and so there is no margin for error in that. That is a that is a savage teacher. Uh, but it really rounded me out in color theory. So by the time I took an apprenticeship down at a super bouge salon in West LA, um, I had a really solid theoretical understanding of color and dressed hair from my work in the theater. And so between those two things, I sort of jumped off in um, corrective color and bridal styling and then got into cutting theory as I started to teach for L'Oreal Brands. That's amazing. Um, not to name drop here, but you know, uh, when we had Philip Wolf on the podcast, he talked about like how he was brought up with like this very British way of seeing hair and doing hair. And then when he moved to LA, like he, he, he kind of felt like he was behind a little bit. And, and the reason was, is that because in LA they had more of a, uh, of a dressing aesthetic than, mm. than what he was, than what he, like they finished hair, finished hair more mm -hmm. like, and like the clientele wanted the finished hair and like, like, and there was no BS. You're not BSing them through a finish. Like they knew what they wanted more than you knew what to do kind of thing. Um, and then he said that, you know, he started working for, I think it was Privé, which was like a, French, Oh yeah. 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 It was a French based mm -hmm. hair salon. And then, um, and then he said, that's, that's where I learned how to dress hair, you know, and like, and I think why, I think why Philip is so great is because um, he cuts hair like a Brit, but he finishes hair like a, like a, a, not to put like nationality on it, but he finishes hair, you know, like, a, like a Frenchman, you know, or a French person, you know? So, so like, it's like, he's got the, he, he's a master at both. Right. And, and, and it's, just, it's this amazing um, melting of that, you know, it's, it, it's kind of corn. It kind of reminds me that like, no matter who you are, just be you. And mm -hmm. that's the space, you, you know, the space that you belong in is the space that you, what makes you is what is special, right? And what makes you is what the world will see as special. Yes, absolutely. And I love that too. I think part of what makes us unique as professionals and artists really is a yes and kind of marriage of what we maybe came from and then what we're, we're bringing into and that swirling together of aspiration and maybe origin identity is really what creates the thumbprint of what makes us unique. And that's why two stylists, you know, going through the same school, learning the same color theory, applying the same formula are going to have a slightly different brush stroke. And that's the, that's the sweetest part about it. That's what makes you you. That's amazing. I love that. I do too. I just how you like describe things and how you talk about them and navigate through them. It's just so nice to listen to. Oh, that's so kind. Thank you. It, is. <laughs> it really is. So, um, I, well, I'm going to give you the lead. So, so when we, I know that there was one particular thing that when we talked about Marlene and she talked about Andy that fired you up. Uh, 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 let's let, let's get into that conversation um, with uh, w with Andy and it was about like the haircutting and what all that means. Yeah, well, so one thing Marlene, we might have talked about this before, but one thing um, Marlene had mentioned when describing your amazingness was um, the way that you cut hair and how you connect with the the person in your chair and kind of that like mini journey you go on with them through. Can you so can you like talk a little bit more about that and 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 how it relates to what you do? Yeah. So, I mean, talk about a yes and kind of identity, right? Nothing that we're ever doing is just one thing. And so, you know, sometimes a haircut is just a haircut, but quite often it's something that we're using as either consciously or unconsciously um, a threshold, some sort of acknowledgement of something happening. And we don't think about it, right? But we get a new job, we get married, we break up, we move, we you know, have these life changes and we want something to market. 
so what I found in some of those um, high, what do we want to say, high expectation, high impact, high control, um, upscale salon experiences, having folks come in and wanting something and there being um, a real friction between what they were saying they wanted and what it was that they actually wanted to receive from it. And so what I started to work with was kind of bringing the unconscious um, desire or what was really motivating the change to, to life. So, you know, do you, do you want to move from being a blonde to a, a brunette sharp bob or are you looking to be taken more seriously? And if we create this change in shape, is that actually going to mean that you're taking yourself seriously enough? Or is it going to be creating confusion because you still don't take yourself seriously and, this and is you're con- presenting? Th- this is the conversations you were having with people. 100%. Wow. 100%. Because that's kind of intense to say to someone, like, do you actually want to be taken more seriously? Like, that's that's different. I mean, it, it almost feels like shade. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that may, be, that may be a very pointed aspect of it, um, but... <laughs> But there are there are there are softer there are softer shades perhaps is how we would say that softer shades. Um, but the truth is, there's motivation that we're having for everything that we're doing. And what I've learned, especially in beauty, is that there are often shady aspects of needs that we're trying to get met that we're looking for in the external. Um, presentation of that, right? We saw this a lot in COVID where folks were freaking out about getting their grades covered. And part of that was we're in a situation socially that we're being really presented with our, mort- our mortality and then watching ourselves age in the mirror was freaking us out. But until we could put a name on that, then we were chasing a box of hair color and looking for that to do something way deeper and more serious and kind of more scary. So, you know, everything that we do is a diary. Everything is a self-portrait. And the way that we approach our aesthetic is kind of the most constant communication we're making about ourselves. So to get clear about what we're actually trying to say and why we're saying it is is a, is a pretty significant part of what hairdressers are doing. Um, I joke that, you know, what what do witches and clergy and hairdressers have in common besides all three wearing black, right, is that there is this kind of work that's being done in the everyday engagement with the world. Um, there's always layers beneath everything. And I'm not just talking about like concave <laughs> haircuts. Yeah. I love that. And, and, you know, so, but how do you get to this place where you're like, do you just understand that? And you're automatically understanding when you're talking to your clients that this is how these conversations need to go. Or was there like a turning point for you where you're like, Come, these need, these conversations need to be a little bit different. I, it definitely has been a slow build. We did not jump from zero to, are you taking yourself seriously? (laughs) Uh, And and (laughs) that's coming in a little hot. Um, And part of it, I think, is understanding who we are, first of all, like what's actually happening behind the chair. And then there's a whole set of soft skills that some of us are working with naturally. There's an instinctual or intuitive nature about it. And some of us really have to develop those. Um, So looking at the acknowledgement of what's actually happening behind the chair and then what I need to keep doing that work um, and do it well and do it responsibly has been a huge part of my own process. And that came like most of it does through a a face plant, right? Um, And some big life experiences that I couldn't fake it anymore. Um, so through my own healing process is how I learned to be with people more authentically. And I found when I could show up and be real about what was moving me in the world, even just casually in conversation, um, someone says, how are you? And actually freaking answer honestly, uh, that can be a great 
ground to lay and foundational place for more connective, intentional experiences that actually really effortlessly and authentically kind of blossom out from there. Yeah. What did you learn after your face plant? What did I learn after my face plant? Uh, And not, and not, I mean, just like meaning like, what did you learn that then you could pay forward? Oh, that's a great question. What I learned is how, how there is a actual physical energetic exchange that is happening in these relational transactions. Whether we are in romantic partnerships, business partnerships, client professional partnerships, any kind of direct one-to-one exchange, there is uh, a, a transaction that's happening. And I don't mean that they are transactional processes, but there is something that's being exchanged. So if I'm not clear about what I'm exchanging in this, then we're operating on what we like to call unconscious contracts. And that's where we can get into um, emotional debt. We can get into like approval addiction, people pleasing, right? All of these things that were happening. And what I learned is when my mental and emotional bank got zapped, I had no more margins to work with because of stuff that had happened in my life. It became really apparent how I was going into emotional debt. Um, by performing for all of these relationships um, in a way that I frankly couldn't afford. And when we look at that scaled back across the industry, we look at rates of things like substance addiction, um, people pleasing, mental health disorders, the burnout rate, compassion fatigue, and the really average short lifespan of a, a hairdresser's career. And it becomes really evident how, oh, this entire business is based on imbalanced exchanges. So in order to stay in it longer, I had to get really clear about my boundaries, about self-care, about um, adequate pricing, better consultations, and getting real real about what was actually happening there. So the pay it forward was that I got to keep doing what I love longer. Mm-hmm. Um, it didn't it didn't consume me and burn me out. Um, and I got to start talking with other hairdressers about how to make their work more authentic and have it cost them less to do what they love. I, I will say I'm like 17 years into being behind the chair and I have those moments where, you know, a client will ask me, how are you? And I do answer honestly, or I want to answer honestly, or they answer honestly, where they've like had something happen to them or whatever. And it's more, it's feeling more, especially as my relationships have been longer with these clients, I'm getting deeper with them. And I feel like probably a lot of people in the same position as me, where we're at this like precipice in our um, existence as a hairdresser that we want to give more or do more. It's like this piece is missing that we don't know how to access. And I feel like it's a lot about what you're talking about. Just, just, and I don't know if maybe it's just an opening up or maybe it's a, it's allowing that energy to, to, to come in and, and you be mm-hmm. a little bit more vulnerable with your client. Like maybe that's what it is, but I also think though, too, I mean, if we're having honest conversation again, is I think that being in a suite um, changes the game too. Like, like, I think like, yeah. I think, I think like how being in a suite and being alone in a suite with a client is, is a different conversation than if there's, it's a more honest, authentic, like, let me show you my wounds here. And the person next to you isn't listening. At least that's kind of been my, I think we talked, yeah. about, we well, talked about that with Amanda yeah. and, 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 and Jeremy, how like being in a suite or being in like a more private setting as, as such as life. Right. I mean, like well, it's you have different conversations with your husband than you, at home than you do at, at a mm-hmm. restaurant, you know, whatever that is, you know, so. But it's interesting because there's been this big transition where everyone is moving into suites but in that transition there's a responsibility you know it's gotten a lot more intense and you need to take more care and that piece that's a big piece and I think that's a lot of like what you're talking about too absolutely and you know I would respectfully disagree with that I think that the work meets you where you are and I definitely started doing I would say deeper work in a 
packed, like 900 square foot, 10 chair salon in Santa Monica, like at 12 hour days. And so it is absolutely possible. And I think that's something that I see this tension of with a lot of stylists that I talk to about wanting to add more meaning, add more substance to their work is they feel like it has to be different, right? Well, I can do it when, or I can't do it here. And so that's the sort of future orientation to them being who they want to be. And I just don't think that's true. Certainly, there's um, a different conversation you're going to have with intimacy, you know, and with a partner at home versus a restaurant. And also, there's something about the context of a noisy public space that can also provide a little bit of anonymity and distraction and have its own kind of magic. Um, but to your point, Katie, I do think that there's a couple pieces about this that are really important. Um, one is that at a beauty school level, there are some really basic, I mean, it's like psych 101 kind of um, principles about interpersonal relationships that I think should be a part of every core curriculum. Um, because of those not knowing what's actually happening or not having the communication skills, I think would honestly get us like 90% there. Um, so a large part of what I do with stylists is we talk about what are essentially kind of coaching skills um, in understanding how to facilitate an experience with your client that still maintains professional, like professional boundaries and that responsibility of access, um, but lets them have also a deeper experience. Um, so you get to be present, but it is still a, it is still a professional exchange. So understanding that that piece is missing from industry education, I think is a huge, huge part of it. I, so, some of it, and I don't mean to argue. <laughs> no, 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 no. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some of it I feel like is just experience. It's just mm. like me being in the, the industry for 17 years. There's so much I know now that I'm trying to understand how I can teach that at the at mm. that beginning level, because like understanding how to console someone and not make it about you when they've lost someone or something's happened like that's tough. And I, you know, that, that's my kind of struggle with how do you then help someone to understand 15 years of experience in that school environment so that they're so much more prepared going out there? Yeah, I was going to go kind of to the same space as like, I mean, the, the shoes that I stand in now, this conversation makes sense to me, but, but kind of looking back and like what, what happens, what really happens here, Andy, or, or why you were talking about, and you know, what, what was, what was flashing before my eyes was that like, is that there's a power dynamic there, right? So like early mm. in a career, the power dynamic is all in the clients. Oh my God, I hope I can get a client this week. I hope I can pay my bills this week. You know, I need, I need, I need, I need. You know, it's not this abundant kind of like a, a um, um, thought. It's this, what's the opposite of abundance? It's scarcity. It's a scarcity. It's a scarcity. It's a scarcity mentality. But it has to be right until you kind of you until you kind of build your book. You know, it's like saying like, let me tell you how to be twenty five. Let me tell you how to be 24. Let me let me coach you into being 26 years old. You know, you can't do that until you're 28, right? Like, like you don't know what it's like to be 26 until you've been 28, right? You don't know what it's like to be 24 until you've been 30, you know, or or whatever that experience or whatever that experience is. So, yes, I mean, I, I agree that we need to have better skills in this, but I also know that you know, early on in my career, it was a it, there's a different power dynamic. And frankly, there was a different security thing. Like, you know, like, like, let's not forget that, like, when we're 20 years old and we're getting into the workspace, that, that your first 15 years are filled with all your insecurities and you're trying to work that out, right? <laughs> like, you're trying to figure out, like, what the hell is this life is about? And it's not even about I didn't cut her layers too short. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that conversation is, right? You know, so it, it's, it's just about that. Like, I know that, um, like, I think about, I, I've never met, like, a hair, I've never met a, uh, a, a person that owns a hair school where the owners weren't complete jerks, right? Like I've never yeah. met to where like where the perceived is complete jerk, right? Yeah, yeah. But then, but then, uh, upon further review, I realized that wow, this is the first adult relationship that they've had outside of their family, 
Mm. Right. And, 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 and what's happened is, is that yeah, that's real. That's real. Right. It's the first mm -hmm. adult relationship that you had with outside of your family, a and B the way that you, and I think that this is natural, by the way, I think, I think, I think you're a jerk to your parents at 18 because everybody's trying to, trying to figure out what, what, who am I and what, what's next, mm -hmm. you know? So they go like, okay, well it worked being a jerk to my parents. So now I'm going to be a jerk to these, to the next adult thing. And then it takes many, many years experience to go like, Oh, wait a sec. None of these people in my life are the common denominator, right? The only common denominator is me in, in, in my relationships with all these people. Anyways, that's it. Andy, you're Oh my up. gosh. I would, I would, I mean, yes, preach. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes. Say more. Um, I, one of the first things that I talk about is that the mirror works both ways, right? Like we're looking at somebody in that mirror and we are also looking back at ourselves and we think like, oh, you get the kind of, I don't know if they still say this in, in, in my day, they would say you attract your, the client that you are, yeah, right? Yeah. So if you don't like your clients, look at yourself because of that vibrational alignment, like like finds like, and that gets a little tricky when you get into somebody who's, you know, going through really hard things or whatever, whatever. At that point, you can say, you know, sometimes you can only see the train because you've been on it, right? Mm. Um, but I think that that's a, a point of graduation. That first piece of self-examination, though, I think is exactly, Katie, where that starts. You know, how do you begin at the beginning with someone is that you you say, like, are you doing this to feel good or are you doing it to not feel bad? And that can be a conversation for me as a stylist. Am I staying late? Am I giving a discount? Am I giving a free redo because I don't want to feel bad? Or am I doing it because it's in my integrity and it's the right thing to do? And that same conversation, they get to be an equal dialogue between the client. Do you want to make this change because it feels good? Or do you want to do it because you're afraid to feel bad? And while, while there can be some really beautiful um, facilitation opportunities with our clients in this regard, the beautiful thing about what we are doing behind the chair is that it is not a power dynamic. And resolving that, I think, is step one, right? Like we are not more smart, better, prettier, have our shit more together than our clients. We are all like working on this together. And having that kind of side-by-side -side processing is actually how a lot of this work started to come up. Like I was talking to my clients. I had a really significant um, tragedy in my life and talking to them about things that I was doing to you. Like, yeah, I'm sleeping like shit. Do you want to do this? I'm doing this meditation podcast thing. Like, do you want to listen to it with me? And we'll talk about it in six weeks. Mm. Um, and so bringing them into our own process conversationally the same way that we would recommend a shampoo that we tried and loved. Um, speaking from this false sense of authority, I think is the sickness that has come into the beauty industry. And it is this like maintaining this performance of knowingness and prestige and whatever, when truly the thing that makes people feel the most connected is being a human together. So it's not necessarily about knowing how to coach someone through a grief process, but having the self-containment of knowing what it felt like and having looked at your own grief so that you can be with someone without needing them to change it. And I think that's where the self-work comes in. There's this idea of wounded healer, that archetype. Have y'all heard about this? Yeah. yeah, sure. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. A so so the the idea of we get this injury and for I think a lot of us in in the world of beauty, it's really about belonging. People come to us and say, what's cool? What's on trend? What they're really asking is, how do I belong? What do I need to do to be accepted, to be loved, to be desirable? How do I belong? So if we come like I did from like the Wild West of you know, childhood trauma and all kinds of stuff, and I'm not addressing that, then what I'm doing is not sharing medicine from what I've learned in my healing. I'm actually just perpetuating my wound because it feels better if everybody's the same kind of insecure that I am. And so that I think we see a lot in salon leadership and in, in some of these power dynamics that are 
kind of built on shaky ground. So level one, the first thing that you can do at 22, at 28, at 48 is start looking at, at yourself and doing your own healing and then sharing that with the people around you. Yeah. Um, yeah. 48. That's easy. 23. That's uh, I, I'm n- not to use this word, but it's it, not to use this word, but I'm going to use it anyways, is nearly impossible, you know, um, you know, certainly I, I can speak through my eyes. Right. And like, I just, I wasn't prepared for that. Right. Like at 23, I wasn't prepared. It, it takes a lot of like getting left hooks in your face before you're like, God damn it. Something's got to change and it can't be the world, you know, but it takes you, it took, it took me a long time to get, it took me too long to get there. You know, I, I think what a lot of say, you know, what's interesting is, and you brought this up and I'm just, we can skip over it if you don't find it relevant or whatever, but like you were talking about childhood trauma and it, it's interesting because we all have it, mm-hmm. right? We all have childhood trauma and that doesn't mean we have bad parents. Oh, it just yeah. means that we, and I don't know what it, I would love to know like what, and if it was, then, you know, I'd probably change the world, but what is it about childhood that's traumatic? You know, because I, I certainly like, I, I, you know, if I kind of think back, I don't know, you know, I, certainly in comparison, you know, the, the, the thief of all joy, you know, I don't necessarily know if my childhood was was much worse than anyone else I can kind of look at. You know what I mean? Like, th- there's definitely like worst case scenarios out there. But but it's interesting that we all have it. And I can't quite figure out. Well, why well, do we all as a child, you're so impressionable and you know nothing. And it's only the things that you trust or whatever, you know what I mean? Like that are right around you. And then as soon as that trust is broken by someone you love, that's a trauma. That's a, that's like, holy shit, what the fuck just happened? Like That's my mom or that, you know, right. like there, she's not supposed to do that. So, so I guess <laughs> as a parent, like, when do you step in at that point? Right. Like, can you step in there and go like, okay, well, I probably broke their trust here. Now what's the next step? I also, by the way, can we talk about this? I had an epiphany two weeks ago. The Can squirrel is it's sh- running around the room today. Is wild. Is wild. <laughs> I, I had this epiphany. Though. I hope. I hope. I hope. I hope it brings value. Or maybe it's just my epiphany. That's fine too. Um, is that I realized that every time that I've been mad or frustrated, it's because I didn't know what the next step was. Right. So even mm-hmm. even if I'm like in an argument, like with my wife, for instance, right? Like the 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 frustration usually came with like I don't know how to convey my message. I don't know what, how to convey what I'm really trying to say, or I don't know what the, this is frustrating to me, or I'm mad at this because I don't know how to take that next step, you know? And, and, and once I had that epiphany, I was like, oh, this could be game changing for me. Right. Because every time I get frustrated, like what's, instead of saying like, like you owe me this, right. From, from your partner, or whoever, whatever you're frustrated with, you owe me this, the world needs to fix this. I can slow down and I can go like, what am I missing? Mm. You know, and now I'm having a different conversation with myself. Anyways, that was worth two cents. I think it was actually worth a whole lot more than two cents, because what you're talking about there is our tolerance for uncertainty. And whether it's big T trauma or little T trauma um, about do I know where my next meal is coming from or do I know that I'm going to be able to sit at the cool kids table, right? Both of those things are creating environments for uncertainty. And absolutely, when we're kids, we're like little sponges. And so what we learn about what the the nature of the world is by default, is it an, an inherently dangerous place? Is it an inherently benevolent place? If I don't know, if I can't see what's in that grass, is it more likely to be a lion that's going to eat me or is it more likely to be, you know, something else, Right. So that uncertainty tolerance shows up absolutely as children. Um, And I got to say, too, I'm I'm, I'm back in school. I started I started my undergrad uh, from zero, like math 101 at 40. So it is never too late to do something that you love. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I'm actually also hanging out with a shit ton of 23 year olds. (laughs) And I got to tell you, 40. They are making them different than they were they when we were there. Different. Thank you. They Thank you, so, They are so different. And I, but I think that this is part of it, right? Like we're talking about generations that have come up with a collective trauma about uncertainty. And so their reach for understanding, for meaning making, for connecting, for collective activism they are arriving at this without 20 years of the school of hard knocks that a bunch of us have come to. So I would respectfully disagree that I think that 
I'm meeting 19 year olds that are so fucking plugged in. It blows my mind. And it is giving me such, such hope about the world um, because these folks are seeing what it means to not address this work. They have been born into a world where these um, unconscious behaviors have been running the show and they're walking and going, well, shit, this isn't going to work. So what else is available? And I think the level of personal accountability, awareness, reflection, involvement is a huge generational evolution. I mean, I honestly think empathy is the next opposable thumb and these kids are sprouting it. Mm. I love that. They're Those all are little the hairdressers. <laughs> <laughs> well, not the one she's hanging out with. She's back at like math. One right. One. Well, yeah. We do math. <laughs> we do math. <laughs> yeah, I know. I understood there would be no math. And here we are. Yes. That's amazing. Dude, that's so great to hear. Like, I'm I, I'm so happy that, that that you're experiencing that. Like, that's that, that that's hopeful, you know. Um, I, I like the thinking about the world different. I just love that because I feel like we come from that place all the time or we try to. And that's why we were so interested in talking to you, too, because I just feel like this needs to be out there more. And this is not wellness like your, you know, yes, you want to take care of your body, but, you know, mm-hmm. and sitting behind the chair and body positioning and all of that. Like, this is just so much deeper because what we do is so important. And I just feel like, you know, a, a lot of people start, they become a hairdresser because they want to take care of people. And this is like an extension of that. And this is making them even better, like talking like this and, and taking care. Cindy, can I ask you what you consume? What I what I consume other than coffee and almond milk? Yeah, yeah, not not not, not food wise, but like 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 I'm this big believer that you know, like for years we heard you are what you eat, mm-hmm. but you know, but mm-hmm. the eating is also what are you watching on social media? What are you what are you putting your attention mm-hmm. to? And 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 how that um and I don't mean this in like maybe I do mean this in a grandiose way, but like 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 how does it present itself? Because um as a as a simple quick as a quick example like i don't do politics because politics doesn't bring out my best self it brings out my worst self um and i don't have a mature enough relationship with it so i i literally just i i'm very much the the head in the sand person now um but but with that also there was other learns like oh like if i look at miserable people on on if i'm being entertained let's put it in that way let's position it like that if i'm being entertained Mm -hmm. by people that are being miserable what is it where is that putting me in, 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 where where does that put my mindset? You know, and if I'm really looking for a positive mindset, then I must, I must like consume stuff that is going to put me in a positive mindset and not make fun of, or not make this, you know, just, just to be for me again, this is just for me, but like, like, like if I consume gross, I feel gross. Right. If I, if I, if I, if I'm watching the, uh, the, 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 what's that show? Like the 600 pound, whatever, you know, it, mm. it's not really like filled with a lot of positive kind of like, interaction you know what i mean so anyway so andy i i throw the question back to you now that i've over explained what, what, what do you consume no i love it and i love that your distinction about what you're finding entertaining because i think if we can find entertainment or value or essentially it's joy right if we're getting a dopamine hit mm. from misfortune or suffering right then that is widening that neural pathway Um, I think understanding why we're drawn to what we're drawn to. I had a therapist that was talking to me about why people watch a lot of true crime and we know we're so fascinated with it, but that it actually activates the nervous system into hypervigilance. So it's like any addiction, right? So the more traumatized you are, the bigger hit you need, Mm -hmm. the gorier and scarier it has to be. So we're like keeping ourselves activated, right? Which is fascinating. Um, I can't do that stuff. It gives me bad dreams anyway on a good day. Uh, and I'm also really boring right now because most of what I'm reading are like the trials of Galileo and shit for school. <laughs> so there's, it's value in it. Absolutely. There's value in it. Um, in my free time, I really try to get into traditional myth and storytelling. I've always been really curious about that um, because I think that there's so much healing property in the way that we learn narratives. So looking at traditional storytelling as Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey, right? Myth as morality really lets me understand how stories are shaped. And so even when I'm looking at stuff that doesn't feel as good, like politics or what have you, 
um, I'm, I'm recognizing those story arcs mm -hmm. and understanding, again, people like we are all just casting ourselves in the psychodrama of trying to get needs met everywhere we go. We are always that little child who doesn't know how to ask for what we need um, and doesn't think that that's available. So we're trying to figure that out. Lots and lots of self-help stuff, obviously. Like, you know, I've been reading that since I was a kid. Um, I do a lot of poetry. I try to find things that are going to provoke me and shake shake the snow globe um, into shuffling up the way that I think and the perspective that I see on the world. Um, I don't watch a lot of hair content. I try to support people that I have relationships with and have met, you know, internet and otherwise. But I actually don't watch a lot of content because if I have an idea, I kind of want it to be my own. Um, and I do think that there's something about like we all tune into the great antenna. And so these ideas come in, you know, in mass that way. Um, but I like to keep my feed pretty tidy in that way. And also really not read the news, not look at social media. Again, like checking, am I doing this to feel good or am I doing it to not feel bad? Am I doing it to distract? Am I doing it to take my mind off? Am I doing it because I'm really curious about what this person is doing? So checking my motives about it is key. Um, I also do a lot of instrumental consumption. So like binaural beats, I'm super, oh, super those. into. Yeah, do you yeah with so I, I do. I have. And um, I love my wife and I do a lot of like sleep talk down meditations. Um, if you've got anxiety, we do a lot of uh, nothing much happens, which is like a, it's an interesting place of, of neuroscience and like how we're balancing our brains because the world out there is like throwing us off kilter all the time. So if it's not feeding me and making me feel better, um, I will swallow some nasty medicine if it's for a purpose. I try to stay connected to social issues and what's happening in the world because I think that's part of I'm making uh, myself aware of how to imagine solutions. Um, but when I start to do it gratuitously, I have to unplug. I love that. And and, and yeah. the key is the key is though is to finding that it's gratuitous, right? Like 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 a, oh, this is the moment, you know that 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 that's amazing. Um, to, uh, a book to recommend is that I just started that I'm loving. I sent it to you is Rick Rubin's the creative act it is amazing. I obsessed, obsessed. It's so good. It's so good. Right. And like, it's so good. I love, I'm doing the audio book, um, a, because it's just my learning style. B I can do it in the car while I'm driving to work and see like, if I find that I farted out for a second, I can push rewind. You know, if I do that in a book, sometimes it'll take me back 18 chapters. You know? <laughs> um, so like, you know, I can like, I can go and, and get into it. And here's what's best about the audio book too, is that if I'm not feeling it that day, if I'm not engaged with what's being said, or if I'm not engaged, I can just pause it till tomorrow. You know, and, and, and with a book, sometimes that, that, that creates more frustration to me than, than doing mm. it. So big proponent and Rick Rubin reads it. So that's amazing too. Cause he's like, he's amazing. Um, and the other thing I also sent this to you, um, and, uh, it was, it was produced, I think in like 2008 or something, you can find it on YouTube and it's called Randy Pausch's last lecture. And I try to consume this about once mm. a year. Um, um, I haven't consumed it in a few years. I actually haven't consumed it since pre um pre covid but um but i sent it to you and um it is the greatest lesson on perspective um that i think i i literally kind of when i think back in the first time i consumed it was 2008 um i think it I, I i think the person that i am today um is because of that you know i think i think i think the person that i am um in the perspective that i have about things is because of that so you know i i i pretty much try to consume it once a year like i said i haven't in many many years at this point but um because I kind of forgot about it. Like I forgot about the perspective. Right. And now when, when it popped back up, I was like, Oh yeah, this is it. The, the, this was the, the, this lecture, which is like an hour long. You can find on YouTube again, just look up the last lecture with Randy Pausch. And if you watch it and, and watch it, um, uh, with, uh, with consumption in mind, right. Like, like that I'm consuming mm -hmm. this and not just like background music. I, I think that you'll, um, I think there's some great lessons in there. I haven't watched it yet because you told me make time to focus when I'm yeah. watching it. So have you, have, have, I haven't have had you that time. It? I have. I feel like I have read it. It's been a while, so I'm. I'm thinking I'm gonna. I'm gonna have that on today too. I've got some salon uh, housekeeping to do, so I might have that on while while I'm working. 
Yeah, yeah. he's amazing. Um, the, the 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 brief story is it is that there, there's actually this lecture series called the Last Lecture, and and the game is that like a a, a college professor is 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 challenged with if this is the last lecture you ever give, what do you, what are you gonna say? You know, nothing, no, nothing, right? Well, time out. You ready? Randy Bausch is terminally ill. He's got three months to live. Oh my God! So just do not get negged out by it. It's the most positive, the most uplifting, the most whatever. He, and this is part of the last lecture. It's like, how am I going to mm -hmm. live? You know, and 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 I'm living more now within death than I ever did living. It's mind blowing. It's such Whoa. a great game changing kind of kind kind of a uh, 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 lesson. Okay, you know, it, it's amazing. I'm I love that you bring that up too, because I think that that is one of the biggest um, misunderstandings that we have about beauty in general is that it is in somehow direct opposition to death or end of life, where the truth is the more fully we can look at that and own it and um, memento mori, right? Everything dies. Then beauty and life becomes celebration and sacred adornment and what are we doing because it sources pleasure and joy and belonging and connection rather than avoiding desperately this thing that is inevitable anyway um there's a beautiful book that i recommended so frequently called uh, the five invitations um and it was written by a guy frank ozdozeki who ran the zen hospice center in san francisco um and it's he did some zen buddhism in there and also some personal anecdotes by him. And it's just some of the sweetest writing. I've never had a book so dog-eared and highlighted. Mm -hmm. Every page has just got these gems. Um, and it's five things that he learned about how to live by working with the dying. Uh, it's beautiful. And I think when we can bring that kind of preciousness to the impermanence of a haircut, then we really are doing sacred work. Uh, do you teach what you do? I do. Yeah. I do. I used to, I, I'm like, how do I do that anymore? Things have changed so much in the, few, in the last few years. Uh, when I met Marlene, we were doing lots of big workshops. We would do two and three day immersives. I probably will bring that up uh, again in the next year. That's on my 2025 um, roster to do some more workshops. Um, I do one-on-one -on -one mentorship. Um, some consulting or coaching in that world. Most of the folks that I meet uh, on this walk, I mean, we all already have it. Um, it's just about having a space to have some permission affirmed that it's okay and that you're not alone in venturing into or wanting something more, something more substantial and something deeper. I love that. Andy, how can people find you? You can find me on the internet. Uh, I am, my personal is at Get a Damn Haircut on Insta. If you want to see pictures of my cat, uh, <laughs> my cat, my dog, my ducks, my baby ducks. So that's all that's happening there. Every now and again, there's a hair picture. Um, I'm in this relationship with reimagining what was my consulting account. So at Crownworks, Crown underscore works on Insta. Um, that website is still there, but mostly I've been building out my little co-op kind of collective business model salon here in Corvallis. So you can find me there. Um, we do some breathwork circles a couple times a month. And if you, if you're looking for a, a chair to come hang out and we got one open. That's that, 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 that's amazing. Um, before we jump out, I want to, uh, she mentioned something early, early on, and I just thought it was amazing. I think you said you were talking to your client and like, um, it was almost like a, almost like a meditation book club. You know, let's do this meditation together and then let's get together in six weeks. I thought that was so cool. Yeah. You know, like we could have like a meditation yeah. book. And like, it'd be really and interesting. It, it'd be really interesting um, if we did like a meditation, if, if one was done, not we, but if one was done and then instead of coming back in six weeks and go, oh, this was this story. Now we're coming back and go like, oh my God, this is what I learned during this meditation practice, you know? And then, and then it, it just seems like a, a, a more deep and real kind of like a, a conversation about what you learned along the way. And like, maybe, maybe after your meditation, you journal or whatever. I don't know. It just, it, 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 it struck me as like, oh my God, that could be so cool. That sounds like some content y'all might be able to develop, Corey. I, I, I hear that coach. <laughs> yeah, that might, that might be available, but how beautiful, right? Because that really is 
reframing and bringing the salon back into service as connection place development secular temple is what I like to call it right this is where we come to cultivate a sense of belonging that is going to last longer than a blow dry that's awesome. Um, listen, if it. you're listening into this and like you're interested in our meditation um, uh, book club, you know, you just let the, the well, we have three members, right? We have three. Yay. Now, right? <laughs> hey, so, yeah. so if you want to be part of our meditation book club and we can set up like a Zoom call every six weeks and talk about, you know, what that would be fun. Um, oh my gosh, so fun. I think it'd be so crazy, wouldn't it? Yeah. I like so it. I, I like it too, with a little breath work and all that good stuff. Andy Scarborough, thank you for hanging out with us. Thank you for giving us time. And thank you very much for joining us on your day off. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends, give us a rating and drop a review to listen to all the latest podcasts. Please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet and to stay connected on and off the show. You can follow us at hair Distry on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again. And we'll see you next time. Peace and love.